Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Jason Wingard. I am Dean of the School of Professional Studies at Columbia University. Thank you for joining us tonight for a discussion on strategy and leadership in the financial services sector. We are joined today by John Shrewsbury, CFO of Wells Fargo. Thank you for joining us, John. Thanks for having me. So in the last 18 months, the news media has revealed some strategic and operational missteps mm -hmm. that Wells Fargo um, has done uh, in the workplace. And I know that you and your other C-suite peers um, at Wells Fargo have done a lot to do structural and strategic changes um, to address some of those missteps. But more importantly, what you've had to do is to communicate not only to your internal stakeholders, but to your customers, whom some of, some of whom have lost trust. And so to build back that consumer trust, you have to communicate to them what you are doing to affect change, how you are rectifying some of the problem areas. And so you and your team have done a good job, I think, of being proactive to communicate to those customers um, what those changes have been. Now, as you think about it, um, you know, during this time of scrutiny, you know, what are some of the strategies that have informed the way in which you are making changes, the way in which you are communicating to the media and to, more importantly, those customers to build back that trust? What is going on behind the scenes that you and your peers are doing to make up for some of these missteps? Yeah, that's a good question. So it starts with making sure that you're executing on fundamental change that you think is responsive to the situation as it's uncovered and that would, would uh, stem the issue in, in the near term and prevent the problem from recurring in the long term. That's sort of table stakes for having something worthwhile to talk about. Uh, having done that, um, you know, we have a lot of different stakeholders that need to be communicated with in a, in a slightly different way. We have customers, first and foremost. We have our own team members. Uh, we have uh, investors uh, of different types in Wells Fargo. Um, we have uh, regulators, we have elected officials, we have NGOs and, uh, and, uh, and other nonprofits that we work very closely with and have for a long time. And for each of them, the, the, um, the presentation of, of what we know, what we're doing, what the future looks like, and what it means for them is a little nuanced. So the first th one of the first things that we did is took our, our, um, in our government relations, our communications or, or media relations, our investor relations, our community relations teams, and put them in one group. And, and previously, for different reasons, they had, been, they had been separated. And we said, listen, let's, let's all just agree on our, on our facts, on our narrative, and our, our communication strategies, yeah. generally speaking, and then for each for each purpose, we can talk about how to deliver the right portion of that message in the right way so that it'll be most impactful for that audience. That was just tactically <coughs> super helpful for, for, uh, for getting things together. Um, this is an aside, but you also have to be prepared for the fact that no matter what your facts are and no matter how you message it, there are certain constituencies who, who've got a, a um, uh, a vested interest in doing something with that information and making it most valuable for them. And so no matter how clear or transparent or, or um, uh, straightforward you are, uh, there's a lot of room for uh, confusion in the echo that goes on for a period of time. So really just getting comfortable with the fact that that's, that's the, the hand that we had dealt ourselves, that was an important, um, it continues to be important because, um, uh, you know, different things mean, mean land on different folks differently and everyone's got their own agenda, um, which is fine. I think, I think using that same information and turning back to our most important constituency, our own, our own team members, sure. um, and making sure that people are heard, making sure that cultural changes and, and the measurement of culture, which we talked about at the beginning, is, is updated and informed by, by the whole process, so the loop really closes uh, is helpful because I think it's in those types of moments that our that team members um, really need to be heard the most, right? Because whenever something, whenever a problem emerges that becomes, uh, you know, uh, reaches a level of awareness company-wide, there's some significant number of team members who've known it for a long time and, and are mad not only that it happened, but mad that, that they knew it and, and maybe they, said, they thought they said something about it, maybe they actually said something about it, maybe they, they were afraid to say something about it and, and, and 
if you can get that right by helping people understand how they can be part of the, mm -hmm. the future, um, that's got a very powerful um, uh, circular effect because then those folks become more engaged, they can become advocates for the company going forward you know, and, uh, and, uh, and they're serving customers every day. So after going through this crisis management process, do you feel confident that your managers will be able to emerge from it as better leaders? Do you feel like your culture will be better? Will Wells Fargo be a better company as a result of some of these missteps? Yeah, I would say along a number of dimensions, it creates a real catalyst for improvement because this is gonna, this is gonna sound funny today, but I mentioned earlier that we, you know, we had a, a very long-lived, very specific statement of culture and then testing mechanisms that convinced everybody that everything was A-OK -okay for years and years and years, only to find out that it wasn't, right? So in that former condition, you, you know, just modernizing the company, making significant strategic changes, pivoting toward digital, taking technology as seriously as, seriously as we have, emphasizing operational excellence and all that it means, very difficult to get, to get uh, across the board buy-in because as far as many people could tell, everything was exactly as it should be and uh, to take a, make a big strategic departure um, would, be, uh, would be just very difficult to do, absent a catalyst. Mm -hmm. When you have a real crisis point in time when everybody can agree, now incidentally, a lot of the people change over the same period of time, so you're dealing with different actors who are less vested in the prior status quo, um, it just becomes a much easier stepping off point to make, to make what would have been heroic decisions that become necessary decisions and as a result, uh, it sets us up, I think, for a, a, uh, a much better platform going forward, I including very simple things like, yeah. like um, speak up, you know, and uh, again, with apologies to people who either did or believe they spoke up, I would say that like, there's nobody at Wells Fargo now who's afraid to raise their hand and say, I think I've, I, I, I've seen a problem and I want to talk about it. Um, that culture is, um, uh, it just, it's much more believable. It's, we didn't realize that it wasn't working previously. Now everybody realizes that it wasn't. So it's just a much, from that perspective, it's a much better place to be and sets us up for, for a better future. We still have to finish going through this process, mm -hmm. which is painful and, and requires a lot of every leader. Um, but for those who remain, uh, you know, call it a year from now, as we're looking back on this and talking about it all retrospectively, I think it's, it's gonna be a fantastic environment. Ernst & Young's Wealth Management Outlook for 2018 stated that the global volume of net investable assets for high net worth individuals is going to increase to 25% in the next couple of years, so it's going to reach $70 trillion by 2021. We have a new master's program in wealth management uh, that is launching next year. I know you don't have access to the core curriculum, but you certainly have access to the practical curricul sure. curriculum on a day-to-day -day basis. So as we think about rolling out this new degree program, as we think about what wealth advisors and wealth managers, current and future, need to know, what advice would you have for that curriculum, given what you know about um, the trends that are happening for high net worth individuals and the advice that they're gonna need, the managers are gonna need to yeah, be able to give I, them? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great program. My, my observation over the last 25 years is that it's an industry where most people have learned on the job mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and there's a lot more to it. So to the extent that you can really credentialize it and professionalize it, I think that's, that's, that's really valuable and a lot is changing. The historical model of, of a, uh, you know, a full service stock broker that you would call and entrust with you know, that piece of, your, of your, your, your life as you were amassing wealth uh, doesn't really exist in the same way anymore. People need complex, um, thoughtful tools for real needs assessment to sit down with a, with a wealth management customer or prospect to find out you know, what, what folks are trying to accomplish at that point in their lives and, and as they grow older. Um, and, the, and the tools are, uh, are excellent and available. I don't think that they're, that they're used as widely as they could be. I think once that's known, the, 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 the notion of establishing um, you know, whether it's a retirement goal or intermediate goals for, you know, f depending on where you're catching up with somebody, buying homes, putting kids through, through college, the other things that every, every family has to go through. 
um, you know, they all have to be thought about very specifically in terms of, of wealth accumulation, borrowing if necessary, access to liquidity at the right point in time. And, and that's the real value added, I think, for customers. We can also talk about the, the more wealthy, where the mm -hmm. sort of pedestrian concerns that most of us have don't apply to them. Um, but for the lion's share of, of, uh, of Americans, you know, it really is about getting to retirement and uh, with comfort and knowing that, that the, um, a certain amount of income and a certain amount of saving with a certain uh, asset allocation and a certain model portfolio will grow to and then decumulate in a way that allows them to achieve their goals. I think in the past, uh, too many wealth managers or budding wealth managers have, have fancied themselves as stock pickers and spent time focusing on individual investment choices rather than thinking about keeping costs low and understanding the needs of their client and then delivering the available solutions for you know separating beta and other for forms of excess return rather than and you know paying up for an average return as as folks are have more wealth to manage which for a lot of wealth managers is where the excitement is i think what's different about today versus the past is um um, there's a lot more of an incidence of illiquid investments and illiquid investment uh, or alternative investment mm -hmm. opportunities for folks. So I think figuring out how to access those in the right way without paying two levels of fees, which a lot of people do, thinking about what their liquidity properties are, thinking about what their correlation properties are in a, in a blow up. You know, this whole generation of wealth managers has never seen a blow up um, uh, right. because it's been, uh, it's been almost 10 years. Um, and when it happens, it'll be swift and severe and merciless and everything will be correlated in spite of what people, you know, prepare themselves for when it happens. Uh, we talked for a moment before also about the psychology uh, of necessary for a good wealth manager. It's true, I think, at every level of wealth, you, we talk most about it when it applies to the people who've got enough wealth to, to really change the decisions in the lives of their offspring or the, whomever they're, they're going to give their money to. Um, we have a big, a big wealth management practice, and in our ultra high net worth practice, we have a, a group that's referred to as family dynamics. That's all they do is talk to families about about the legacy that they want to leave and about how to talk to their uh, you know, their next generations. It may be it may be more than that because generations get wider as they go deeper. So there can be a lot of constituents who've got a dog in the fight, um, and they think about about you know how much is enough, how much is too much, what kind of requirements to put into the opportunity to uh, to participate in uh, in an estate, those types of things. So let's think about those considerations and the human capital element of executing on all the strategy and all the changing complexity and dynamics that you just spoke about. Uh, research has proven that motivating talent requires leaders to exhibit particularly one behavioral trait, and that is listening. And most leaders don't do that well. Uh, and most work really hard through training, through coaching, to do a better job at listening, but it's very difficult in a very fast-paced, dynamic work environment. In higher education and as a dean at Columbia, I do that through a couple of different channels. I have monthly roundtables, for example, with my students, with our faculty, with our staff, to learn more about strategy, get feedback, continuous feedback on strategy and policy, on operations. But it's difficult. It's not frequent enough. And it's not casting the net widely enough, too. There's subsamples sub that I have the chance to do that with. When you think about, once again, your very large organization, uh, the people who report directly to you, the 36,000 who indirectly do not, how do you listen? How do you take the time mm -hmm. to better understand the recommendations, the counsel, the feedback? that your team members have for you that will ultimately influence the decisions that you need to be making strategically uh, and operationally that you may or may not have access to on a regular basis. My initial response, especially as it relates to the people who report directly to me or the people who report directly to them who are real subject matter experts, is that in their area of focus, um, they're all uh, stone cold experts and much better at what they're responsible for than I could possibly be. Sure. So, um, you know, when, I, when, when they're giving me counsel on something that, that is in their wheelhouse, uh, it would be like not taking the advice of a doctor if you went to see the doctor, right? It would be, you know, I, I don't know more than they do and I never will. I think, it's, I think it can be really dangerous when, when a leader uh, surrounds themselves with people who think like they do, who have very similar capabilities, experiences that they do, because then 
uh, you're not really learning much from one another. Um, but there, the, the parts of the business that I manage are so relatively discreet in terms of their, the strength that they require or the, or the prerequisites that they require for the leader to be credible that, that, that I'm getting feedback from somebody who knows a lot more about their thing than I do. So that makes it easy to listen to them. Sure. Um, you, you have to figure out, I mean, we all, I, I think, uh, uh, would think it's attractive and valuable to be super transparent, open door policy, come on in, we'll talk freely about everything, which is, which is good because it promotes an exchange of ideas. Um, but there's also a signal to noise ratio issue that you have to work on. The more feedback you're getting, the more you have to work to figure out what is reliable and, and what isn't. And um, uh, you know, some mechanisms for increasing reliability might, might uh, throttle back on the, the total amount of, of feedback that you're getting. So what, depending on what kind of a business you're, or what kind of an activity you're managing, you're gonna have to figure out about where that, that inflection point is where you're encouraging as much as you can get, but there isn't so much of it that you can't, you can't see the good stuff because of the, the other well-intended good ideas, but that, that don't have enough context or, or rigorous underpinning to actually be uh, valuable. I recently sat down with feminist icon Gloria Steinem, and we were talking about the characteristics um, of being a good mentor or a mentee. And in that context, we were talking about female leaders and the need to have a strong mentor, a strong sponsor, uh, people to talk to that can help advance your career. In the general context, though, for leadership, um, one of the things that I do, I talk to our graduate students about building a personal board of directors mm -hmm. as a tool for having a group, a professional network of advisors who can counsel, who can mentor, who can provide sponsorship, who can help you advance in your career. Who's on your personal board of advisors? Yeah, it's a, I, that's an excellent question, and I've never heard, I've never heard it, heard it uh, put that way, but we all have people in our lives that we turn to um, I think of it a little different as a board because I never get these people all in the same room at the same time, <laughs> the, the people who, who I turn to. But Virtual. yeah, everybody who's ever been my boss is, um, is uh, I talk to regularly uh, or communicate with regularly about, about things that are happening in my life or sometimes things that are happening in theirs where you need feedback, you want context, you want to know whether you're, you've lost your mind for a moment. Um, I have, uh, I have uh, you know, friends and neighbors. I've got, you know, just folks who I respect in the local business community who I've really hit it off with. Um, I've got my, my business school classmates who are among my closest friends, and it's been more than 25 years. Um, and, and a few of them, in different ways, for different reasons, I would, I call on to, uh, to give me feedback, on, you know, either because it's their specialty or it's just a sanity check on whether I'm making a good decision. If it's a, if it's a business-related decision, I can't really bring anybody outside of Wells Fargo into the facts around <laughs> a decision that I'm trying to make. But you know, you can you can create a hypothetical or you know make things. You can redact uh, uh, things sometimes in a way where it's helpful. I'd say my wife is on my board of directors. She's the chairman of my board of directors. <laughs> <laughs> um, you should have said that first. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen. I mean, it, it's. Uh, you guys are, you've all been working, you're gonna be working for a long time, and, and it doesn't work unless it works at home. And sometimes you're alone at home, sometimes you're married, sometimes you have kids, you know, wh whatever your situation is, it's gotta be, it's gotta work for everybody, or it doesn't work at all. So, um, you know, I, I, would, uh, uh, I would never be able to get done what I need to get done if my chairman didn't really buy into our strategy because, <laughs> because there's a lot to do, right? And it has, we have to work together. So uh, I would throw that out there um, for everybody to, to think about a little bit. But I, I do think this, and that your board grows over time because you, sure. you amass more. Nobody drops off, people just, people just add on. And I, I would say that, that most of the, or several of the folks that I'm thinking of have, they may not even know it, but they've been mentors of mine over the last 25 or 30 years because, you know, through informal relationships, you know, the more you, you, you ping people and you ask them for feedback and eventually you reach an age where they ask you for feedback too. Um, you, you know, you've, you've, you've created mentoring relationships informally and they, and they become something more than that, but, um, but they're critical, I think, in professional development. So in the financial services industry, working for a very large firm, and being in a very senior level, you have a lot of pressures on you, uh, financial pressures, performance pressures, political pressures. We've talked about a lot of those today. Leaders often have difficulty remaining authentic. 
in the face of all of those pressures. So as you go about the daily task of doing your job and managing your people and responding to crises and change and doing well and going through dips and, and, uh, and heights, how do you remain authentic? How do you stay true to the values that you have and manage to still satisfy your professional metrics and your professional obligations while not compromising on who you are and what you believe in? Yeah, it's a, it's, uh, that's an interesting question. I've never thought about it that way. I think it starts with um, really believing in the company or enterprise that you, that you work for because if you were if you had a job as a senior spokesperson and a signing representative uh, at the highest level of a company that you didn't believe in, you couldn't do it. You couldn't and, you, and remain authentic. There are times, uh, so I mentioned that, that among my direct reports, the people that I really respect and I enjoy spending time with and we, we, have, a, we have good personal relationships. Um, when, the, when the going gets rough and if somebody, if somebody on their team or deeper in the organization you know, really wants to go uh, in, in a specific direction that's inconsistent with what's in the best interest of the company, I have to, I have to side with what's in the best interest of the company. That's just, that's the nature of the job. Right. And, um, and so that's one of those opportunities where you, you have to be, like, you, you have to believe in it because, you know, authentic is going to be at odds with, with, at a personal level, you know, a person that you might have, might have wanted to support, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I think Importantly, and this, this, this has more to do with authenticity in the, in the smaller work group, meaning the, the folks who I'm hierarchically equivalent to and then the folks who report directly to me. That's kind of who I bump into every day. I think you have to have a lot, you have to create a lot of opportunities for honest feedback when it isn't the moment of truth, but just like the regular cadence of think about performance management. So if, you're, if you have a team of, of you know, two, five, or ten people who work for you, they need to know, not just when things aren't going well and you're dissatisfied, but they need to know generally, how am I doing? And it could be lots of positive, constructive feedback and the occasional, you know, I wish we had gone this way and in the future, you know, let's, let's try it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. But if you're not doing that, then it's really easy, I think, to get emotional or to get angry or to just to have a disconnect of expectations when a moment of truth comes along. Um, I think it's easier if you've been in a regular dialogue about how people are doing versus what, what you and the company would expect them to do, what the requirements are of the role that they're in. Those, that helps with remaining authentic. But it's hard. We've been talking today with John Shrewsbury, CFO of Wells Fargo, talking about strategy and leadership in the financial services sector. John, thank you for joining Talks of Columbia. Thank you.